Um, for the last several years, my lab has been focused in a pursuit. It's to use the power of genomic science and human partnership to head off emerging diseases before they become global pandemics. So in the last part of the 20th century, emerging diseases began to come up out of nowhere. So in 1967, Marburg virus appeared. In 1969, Lassa virus. In 1976, Ebola. And in the 1980s, HIV. And people attributed this to increasing world's population, globalization, changing climates, and our increased encroachment into animal habitats. And in 1990, the Institute of Medicine created a report, a landmark report, called Emerging Infections, Microbial Threats to Health in the United States, in which they coined the term emerging disease. And over time, this has taken off. The report uh, listed uh, many, many microbes that they considered emerging. These were microbes that they believed were new to human populations or rare in the population that were beginning to rise in prevalence. And with the help of popular media, we started to think about this all in the collective conscious. With terms like outbreak or contagion, they sound familiar, or pandemic, and the way that we think about them are monkeys deep in the forest, uh, workers in the Far East with animal products, reports going around the world. And we imagine a scene that looks like this, where there's clinical workers in full protective gear, a village up in arms, a dramatic scene that's very clear what's going on. But our lab has since begun to think that the true view of an emerging disease looks more like this, which is a quiet village, a sleepy mother and her child, with an, a storm brewing inside, going undetected. And the way I started thinking about this, the way my own ideas about this began brewing, were not out in the field. It was actually back at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we have one of the largest genome centers in the world. And we're generating data from genomes, analyzing them, thousands, millions, billions of letters that make up the genomes of us and other species. And the data, the pictures look like this strings and strings of letters in which we're trying to interpret. And the amazing thing about these letters is that they code what make us, and within them hide the secrets of who we are and how we adapt. And so when a new variant emerges in a population and it enhances the ability for one to survive and reproduce and pass on those, those, that mutation, it'll spread very quickly through the population. And when it does, it leaves behind a footprint, a footprint that we can trace to help us track down what that change was, what it did, and get clues to our survival. And the amazing thing is that you can do this by just looking at 100 people living today. If you analyze a population with just that many people, even fewer, and you look at the DNA within them, there's actually an archaeological record that's hidden in our DNA that can tell you about our history. Um, and you can begin to see these variants that have spread through the population and understand what they did. And our, our lab develops these methods that go by and look for those things. And the methods used to be quite coarse. What we could do is we could see these different regions of the genome that were important, but they were very sort of coarse signals with thousands of different variants within them. We were trying to figure out which was the one that was important, that was driving something meaningful. And recently we had a breakthrough. We got much better at localizing where the signal was coming from and trying to understand what had happened. And some of the things that we find are ones that you would expect or at least that sort of are in line with our now picture of human evolution, which were things like changing skin color as we moved out of Africa into regions that had lower light, um, the ability to drink milk and digest milk into adulthood as we domesticated cattle, uh, changes in our red blood cell that protect some from uh, the parasite malaria. But we have found hundreds of these candidates, and we can only explain a handful. Um, and so there are many other candidates. Each one tells a story that we can pursue to understand the key to human survival. And one that uh, sort of attracted my attention was a gene called large, which was critical and under uh, very strong selection in a population of Yoruba ethnicity from Nigeria. And so I went to see what does the gene do um, and how is it acting. And as it turns out, it has many functions, but one of its key functions is that it's critical for the entry of a virus called Lassa virus. So what it does is actually uh, this gene large modifies the receptor for Lassa virus, the key in which the virus can get into the cell. Without this modification, this change, the virus can't enter. And so I wondered whether or not 
seeing this very strong signal of adaptation at this gene in this population, whether or not it had something to do with this virus. And the disease that the virus causes lasts a fever. But that seemed a bit unlikely, because I had gone to medical school and I'd never even heard of Lassa fever. And I went back and I looked in my microbiology textbook, and it's just a footnote there, Lassa virus, one of the arena viruses, but very, sort of very, not very well known, uh, definitely not compared to other viruses like Ebola. So how could it be having such an impact? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the disease, and just want to warn you that the next slide, just for a few seconds, is going to show us a picture that's a little unsettling. So Lassa fever causes a hemorrhagic fever. It's a very deadly disease. It can travel through the air, and it can have fatality rates that exceed 50%. Um, and so it is part of a small set of agents called biosafety level four, like Ebola, like Marburg, like smallpox. These agents pose a very great individual risk as well as a global risk. But unlike what we think about many of these diseases, Lassa is actually known to be quite widespread. And interestingly, it's very common in West Africa and common in Nigeria, where we identified this signal of adaptation. And so we set out there to figure out whether or not um, there might be genetic resistance that may have emerged through this virus being present in that population. Um, and so we went to Irua, Nigeria. So the Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital is a hospital in a rural part of Nigeria, where we set out with collaborators in Germany to begin to study there. Kenema Government Hospital, we partnered with Tulane University, who had set up a facility there to study in rural Sierra Leone. And in order to begin to do this kind of work, just to begin to do research, the first thing you need to do is understand the space. There are clinicians that have been working for many, many years treating this disease and working very hard. And so we partnered with them. And what we did is we brought diagnostics, genomic tests, to test for the virus's presence. Um, and uh, you know, in order to basically enroll individuals into our study and begin to look at it. But obviously, to do ethical research, we have to make sure that all of the patients have the standard of care. So we also ensured that a treatment, ribavirin, was present. And that treatment actually has been shown to reduce the fatality from 55% to 5%, but only if given within the first few days of infection, at a time when, by clinical symptoms, it's really hard to pick up that that's what you have. And so we had done this to set the foundations for our work, but we're surprised by the impact and, the, and sort of the, the amazing impact that exceeded our expectations. Is that you know, as we implemented diagnostics and therapies in these sites, uh, survival started to increase, the population became engaged, and the doctors became empowered. Um, and a couple of stories that the hospital likes to talk about is before we had started there, they used to lose, they would say, three to five physicians and staff each year in the course of treating Lassa fever. Um, but since we instituted this and the policies around it, they haven't lost a staff yet. I'm going to knock on wood for that one. Um, and also, um, you know, women, uh, pregnant women and their, and their children have the highest fatality rates. And they began to survive and succeed. And so we began to get people coming from further and further away, um, from hundreds of kilometers to the hospital. And we saw many Lassa fever patients. And again, just for one moment, I'm going to show that slide of the classic Lassa fever patient that looks like this. Um, and we have many of those, unfortunately. But we also see a large number of people that look like this, seemingly innocuous, but testing positive for Lassa virus, and just as likely to be fatal. And so we began to think these are the undetected, the individuals who we don't know are harboring these diseases. And so the question that we came to is, is this actually emerging disease that we're talking about here? Or are we talking about emerging diagnosis of diseases that have been with us all along? And this picture here uh, was designed by Stephen Geyer, who was the first author of a paper with the same title that we published. And Stephen is not just a scientist, but an artist. He was flying over the Congo River, where um, out of his airplane, he took a picture of the river. It was very close to where Ebola was first discovered. And as an artist, he transformed the river into the shape of the Ebola virus. We published this with the paper to give a sense of, if we looked from a different angle, would we recognize that these viruses are present and have been with us all along? And the data, at least for Lassa fever, suggests that that's the case. So we went back and we looked. And in fact, actually, 
there's a test, antibody test, that can tell you whether or not you've had evidence of having a disease before, being infected with a virus. And in fact, in some populations, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, over 20% of the population have evidence, millions of people have evidence of been exposed to loss of virus. And it would make sense that there is such exposure because that rodent, Mastomys natalensis, has developed the ability to harbor this virus in its blood continually. And it's spread throughout West Africa and even throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we sequence the virus from Nigeria and Sierra Leone, and we can use genomic dating technologies to say how long has the virus been around. And we dated the mutation, and uh, two have emerged, and two have been circulating within Nigeria for over 1,000 years, um, spreading out throughout West Africa. So we're at, now we're not looking at what's an emerging disease. We're looking at a virus that is circulating widely and has been with us for over millennia. And the data I won't show here for Ebola suggests a very similar pattern. So this is, these diseases are here, and we can tackle them. And how does that affect public health, the way we think about it? So you know, this is a circle that we talk about. We had started at the Broad Institute, and we're setting out to study this virus. In order to do so, we had to bring diagnostics to test for it. And we were so successful that the community became engaged, and the doctors became empowered, and we started to get people coming from hundreds of kilometers. And we were able to identify many people with loss of virus. But the vast majority of the people we were looking at have something we don't know. We, they didn't test for the common things like malaria and lasso that we were testing there. Um, and so as we have it, we had all of these different samples. We've sent them back to the United States, and we're identifying all sorts of new things that are infecting these individuals. And the idea is that we are going to take those back and create new diagnostics that incorporate all of these viruses that are circulating and empower the population once again. And it creates this positive loop that rather than going and asking people to help with research or asking them to do surveillance, we're connecting with them, working together to create this local, to enhance the local community and to also enhance the global population, creating this positive loop. And that's what we work to. And this is where it brings us to collaboration. You can't study a disease as lethal and devastating as loss of fever without complete trust in the people that you work with and respect for them. And I have the most amazing group of individuals I work with, my students in my lab, my collaborators in Africa and around the world. They're exceptional people. They're on the front lines of a devastating disease, seeing people die every day, um, but working and working. And we are all severely infected. So this is a t-shirt that I'm wearing that my amazing and creative lab created. Um, it says, I'm severely infected by science. Um, and in the back, it says, um, science is infectious. And it really is. Um, it's extraordinary. I said, the way that science brings people together, working together towards a common cause, towards tackling these emerging diseases before they become global pandemics. These are the amazing women of the Arua Specialist Teaching Hospital where I work. They're not only brilliant and kind, but they have beautiful voices. And I discovered this when I was uh, on a long trip to Nigeria. I'd brought my travel guitar along with me, and I was after work one day playing one of the songs for my uh, alternative rock song for my uh, band, um, and uh, they started harmonizing. And it was amazing. I was just overwhelmed, and I was so excited that I uh, went and recorded the song with them, an acoustic version of the song. Um, and the song essentially is called Headlight Waves, and the idea behind it is it talks about the greed and jealousy and destruction in the world um, and uh, darkness. But as the lyrics go, it says, hold on, it won't be long, hold on. Because I know you come like waves into this darkened light, you light the way, and all of the ways that they fade, you shine.
I want to thank National Geographic for working for the last 125 years to try to preserve the planet. And thank you for allowing me to participate in this journey. We do this for each other and for Lassa Fever patients. Thank you.